And now I can turn to the main event where we're going to hear Eddie Opara from Pentagram. And Pentagram is a multidisciplinary, um, independently owned design studio with a portfolio spanning five decades, many industries, and clients of every size and shape. Um, Eddie, our speaker today, was born in London in 1972. He studied graphic design at the London College of Printing and Yale University. He began his career at ATG and Imaginary Forces and worked as a senior designer art director at 2x4 before establishing his own studio, The Matt Office. He joined Pentagram in, New in the New York office as a partner in 2010, and his projects have included the design of brand identity, publications, packaging, environments, exhibitions, interactive installations, websites, user interfaces, and software, with many of his projects ranging across multiple media, um, across all kinds of media. And his clients, have a, he's got a great list of clients, Lululemon, Samsung, Cooper Hewitt, Smithsonian Design Museum, Nike, Grace Farms, the Manila Foundation, the Corcoran Group, Morgan Stanley, and New York University, as well as Joslin Art Museum. Um, Opera Eddie is a senior critic at the Yale University School of Art and has recently uh, authored a book, Color Works, published by Rockport. He is a member of the Distingu Distinguished Design Society, Alliance Graphique Internationale, and most recently was named an honorary fellow at the Royal College of Art in United Kingdom, which is a great honor. Um, Eddie has been working closely with Johnson over the past two years on our new brand identity. He is also working with the museum on wayfinding and signage systems, and he and his team have played a key role in developing our new website as well. And we could not be more pleased with the work of Eddie and his team. So please join me in welcoming Eddie back to Omaha. Thank you, Jack, and good evening. Cut it there. <laughs> um, that, that was just some work that we had um, created uh, last year. Um, <laughs> that's just from the New York office, actually. Um, what is Pentagram? Well, we are a, um, a collective partnership um, that's been around for 50 year, over 50 years. And uh, this, this image is a little bit out of date. Um, there are actually 23 of us. If anybody's counting as 20 in that picture, this is a, a photograph in Scotland. I am in the uh, uh, cap with a Y. We are, as Jack had stated, the uh, largest uh, independent design firm uh, of, our, of our kind in the world and most renowned. Uh, but I'm not really here to talk about um, Pentagram as such, but really more what I do at Pentagram and what I have done um, with my team for the Jocelyn. Um, and, you know, I, I work in so many different areas um, from large and small companies and organizations, uh, as Jack had stated, from, you know, strategy design and messaging and brand identities uh, you know, you name it, I've, I've, I've sort of done it. Um, a lot of digital work, a lot of software um, for different types of clients in different areas, um, 
But um, I really am um, really interested in the idea of understanding uh, what design is. And I was asked very recently um, to add uh, to a sort of very private book about uh, design um, um, that design is obtaining efficacy by ex uh, extraction through the application of rational thinking, creative skill, and appraisal. And it's also acquiring a transformational and progressive outcome. Um, a, a lot of people say it's about, about sort of solving problems. It's, it's a little bit more than that, I think. And with that of transformative and progressive outcome, my team had recently worked in Omaha to develop um, and create the sort of um, strategic positioning and visual branding for the Omaha Performance Arts um, Opera. But as I stated, I, I'm here to sort of talk about um, what we have done for the Jocelyn. And um, my, my title of this particular presentation is called Regenerative Narrative. And you're probably wondering what that is, right? It sounds really complex, um, <clears throat> but it's not. It's, um, it's neither about nostalgia or pastiche. It's a, it's a rebirth, uh, it's, um, you know, but no, no ordinary rebirth. It's something that is, uh, you could say, um, it's lost a vital element or has never um, had to survive or adapt. Um, it's a rebirth that builds agency, right? That is intelligent and also inclusive. So thus the narrative cannot be compounded into a single perspective. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's really an important factor um, because it has a capacity to evolve and regenerate through new ideas, innovations, new patterns that provide new pathways uh, for uh, us to sort of flourish and thrive. And um, I might sort of jump around a little bit in this particular um, presentation, but um, I don't know if anybody knows who this particular gentleman is. I think Jack and other staff members at uh, the Jocelyn do. Well, this is pra Prince Maximilian um, of uh, Wied, um, no, Neu Wied. Um, and he was a, a German uh, explorer um, and naturalist. And um, he actually traveled through the Great Plains region here in Nebraska with a, a Swiss-French uh, lithographer um, and painter illustrator called Carl Bodmer. And this is actually one of Bodmer's uh, pieces. So, you know, while, while uh, Maximilian's intentions were to sort of describe the aspects of flora and fauna in the interior of, uh, of America, he instead sort of rejected that and was really fascinated by and, and sort of concentrated on describing the culture, language, customs, and appearance of the indigenous people. And I, I think that this is an important factor, and it will come back um, um, to, I'll come back to that in a few moments. So, you know, as you may know or may not know, that uh, Bodmer's uh, has a comprehensive works that can be found in the museum. And, uh, and, and as I said, we'll be back with Prince Maximilian later on in this particular presentation. But first, we need to sort of understand what the new idea of, uh, um, of the Jocelyn sort of brand position um, that we were trying to sculpt with uh, the Jocelyn and others um, <clears throat> would be and how we sort of got there. And we, we really want to talk to people. We love talking to people. It's exceedingly important. Talking to the community is exceedingly important. But as well as that, there are 31 sort of um, key stakeholders that we talk to. Over 2008 surveyed respondents um, that we reached, um, you know, the corners of uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and also beyond. And that sort of fulfills this aspect of 20 hours of conversation. And so what do we get from that? A lot. It's, it's exceedingly important 
that we um, di you know, digest um, what, is, uh, um, what is coming towards us. Um, whether somebody is a mega fan um, who's never been to the Jocelyn, who's contrarian to it. Um, these things are exceedingly important to understand where the um, museum is um, going or has actually come from. And so with that, we sort of garnered um, the appropriate um, positioning um, that we, so we started off with that we're respected, as in the Jocelyn is respected, but not overly edgy. That's, that was a wonderful sort of um, culmination that we sort of uh, sourced from all that conversation. That design excellence is at the forefront. That, was, that Jocelyn really needs to sort of push the boundaries to achieve bold change, you know, absolutely. Right? That was exceedingly important. But always with the aspect of taste, right? Um, with taste and integrity, with uh, maturity, and a sense of admiration within and for the institution itself. That design excellence is at the forefront, no matter what. Right? Another was that the dynamic, but not quiet. So as we know, art isn't boring. It's not supposed to be. And neither is the Jocelyn. Why should it be? You know, um, but, but the fact of the matter is that they, Jocelyn had been too quiet for quite some time. It was a little too long. And so the brand itself, within the language that it uses um, verbally and visually and architecturally, needs to sort of spark the sense of creativity, ideas and actions, and also via the conversations that we had heard as well. And but there is one other thing that, even though art isn't boring, there's a sense of quietness that uh, is tranquil. And even in tranquility, there still can be an underlying sense of energy. So we needed to remember that too. But more so, it's illuminating. Right? So great art and also architecture sort of makes you really think, doesn't it not? Right? That the brand should also feel insightful and, uh, and have a sense of being uplifting. And so the Jocelyn sort of illuminates rather than intimidates. That's a very important factor, again, from the prospects of, of the community. Um, Museums right across um, America and also parts of the world, more so West, the Western world, have had to grapple with this idea of intimidation um, that the, the, um, this in, the institutions that they have created over the course of centuries can be seen as intimidating to certain community members. And that should not be the case in point, that there needs to be a fresh rather than formal look that there is a light rather than a sense of dark. And so we produced an idea, a brand idea, an idea that can flourish and could be a, what we call a North Star. You probably may have heard this if you're dealing with any sort of brand communications, the idea of regenerations. And Regenerations is about perpetual becoming and sense of change. It's all about being fresh and it speaks to an ending renewal, right? So our evolution through our generations is for generations. So every, every new year requires, requires us to let go of what is for and what can be and to wonder, to imagine, to reimagine. And there's a continual opportunity to spark new ideas at the Jocelyn through the artwork, through the messaging, through the design, where the greats of the past inspire the people of today and also tomorrow. So it's not forgetting, it's not about, it's not about nostalgia, it's not about prestige, it's about all of that. And, and so where do, where do 
we come in, as in pentagram, with the aspects of visual design? Well, we thought of it um, in a different type of way. And there are sort of five specific ideals that we came up with very immediately. That the Jocelyn needs only a logo type. We'll talk about that in, uh, momentarily. Typography is at the foundation of the identity. Typography aligns with the perpetual becoming and change of regenerations. And typography will be respected, dynamic, and illuminating. So, let type be the, the torchbearer for the narrative. Right? It's, a, it's a natural, the great thing about typography, type design as well, is that it's a natural thread that weaves everything together. Logo types, logos don't normally do that. So take the aspects of, of, um, of, a, of a, a logo that you may know. Um, let's say Twitter. Right? Um, now is X, right? Um, it doesn't really sort of naturally thread itself um, through everything and brings everything together. It doesn't really do that. It doesn't do it well at all. And that's not what the owner wants it to do. It wants to do something entirely different. So in this particular case, typography, uh, you know, imbues with contextual meaning. Right? Let it not be inert, but energizing people again and again and again, every time that you see it. And it also depends upon um, what type of type. And with that, I sort of lean towards the Jocelyn and the architecture. And not so much the architecture as it stands, but more so what is inscribed on <clears throat> or how it's inscribed on the building. So Hartley Burr Alexander was an expert on Native American anthropology, and he wrote the inscriptions for the building, some towards being slightly controversial, but he also had the aid of a young Serbian-American uh, from Chicago. Uh, he was a sculptor named John David Burton. And the fact of the matter is that this is one of um, an example of, of Burson's work. Have you ever, ever seen anything like this anywhere in America or anywhere in the world? It's quite unique and at times typographically uncanny. Very individualistic, but also striking, very striking. And typography is and does that. Um, there is, um, if anybody's very interested in, in type, especially when they're sort of reading a novel, um, you should read um, Beatrice Ward's um, A Crystal Goblet. It's one of the, the, the essays that one um, reads when you're a student and you're sort of learning about type. <clears throat> it's very fascinating in regards to what type actually does. Um, I'll be very quick about this. Um, what Beatrice basically state is, states is that um, when type is set uh, appropriately and it's the right type of crafting of type, it allows you to not read the text, but uh, actually takes you to another place um, the, where the novel and the writer wants you to. And thus, it's a crystal goblet rather than an ornate gold goblet, which is just decorative in its uh, state. But with that, I lean towards this, Rotis. <clears throat> and you may not know, or well, some of you may not know um, what this name means, but I will basically unravel and reveal what this uh, means to me. Um, to this work that we've done and to the Jocelyn. This <clears throat> um, was the previous um, logo and wordmark um, lockup for the Jocelyn uh, Art Museum. And it, the, the actual type is actually set in what we call rotis. 
Rotus was created by this gentleman here, very young um, um, photograph of Otto Eicher. And he was born in uh, and lived in Ulm in Germany. He was the co-founder of the famous Ulm uh, School of Design, a sort of, um, you can see, can't say it's like an offcut of the of the Bauhaus. It was actually an extension of it, and and Eicher was an unrepentant modernist, but he also pushed um, the idea of the renewal of of modernism. He felt as though, as Mark uh, Holt, um, a very well known British designer and writer, said that had been exhausted, and as you can see. Um, from the, the types of designs that he's created, some of them um, incredibly uh, monumental, such as the Munich 1972 mark, and also everything, all the graphics for the wonderful graphics for Munich 1972 Olympics, um, all the icon systems, the lighting company Erko, Braun, um, famous German um, uh, product um, company, and Lufthansa. Um, that we have today. His, his designs are still around. That's what modernism does to a certain degree. But one of the things that um, Othel wanted to do was create a typeface. And he is seen here holding up his creation, Rotis. He developed in 1988, and he explores um, an attempt to create a sort of a varied typeface family that ranges from um, a serif, a glyphic, and I'll talk about that uh, later, and a sans serif. And because he's, um, and this is the sort of old way of actually looking at, uh, at type um, through a photostat structure on, on, uh, on, uh, on acrylic. Um, it's really fascinating that he really wanted to um, pursue this idea of the, what we call the ultra-legible typeface, which is quite interesting. He never quite finished it because he died, um, unfortunately, um, a few years later. But why is this such an um, important factor? Well, it's because of um, this conversation, this essay and this conversation that happened with this man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is my, one of my partners, uh, Michael Baru. Michael is one of the, um, you could say, tw um, late 20th century and 21st century uh, greatest graphic designers. Um, he was um, born in, in Ohio and, and uh, now lives in New York. Um, he is a fundamentally amazing designer and amazing writer. And um, he wrote um, an essay in 2004 in the online uh, uh, design uh, critiqued uh, magazine, uh, Design Observer Online, um, where he talks about a book entitled Mr. Truman's War that one of his daughters had recommended him to read. He couldn't read it. He couldn't do it. It's because it was set in Garamond, <laughs> I ITC Garamond. He, he, hates it so much. Um, and he said the, the, that uh, it, the book, arrived in the mail a few weeks later, and I opened it up only to receive a hellish, ghastly, devastating shock. <laughs> the entire book, all 400 plus uh, tightly packed pages of it, is set in a typeface that I absolutely despise. I just see Garamond. And so that starts the narrative. But then another man comes <laughs> along. And you know, within the online comments from Design Observer, where sort of numerous commentators sort of ridiculed other typefaces, one sh outed Rotis, and it's the, the great um, graphic designer um, from Germany, Eric Spiekermann. And Eric is, 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 uh, is well-renowned. Um, he actually sort of de he developed the, uh, um, the system for the, um, the U-Bahn, 
um, that uh, if anybody's been to Berlin of <laughs> late, um, that you may have seen, and, um, and other things such as that. Um, and he stated that he hates Rotis. His comments can be considered um, vitriol, um, but really crisp as well. And, and with that vitriol, he states this. Rotis is thus, if I say so myself, a very German typeface. It succeeds because people need white gods so they can switch off their faculty and just believe what they are told. You see, one of the things that Eric Spiekerman uh, is, is, is that he's German. Um, I, I, I can state that with um, criticism. My wife is also German, and they will say whatever is, comes to mind very quickly. And so with that, um, it's quite interesting where he got that term white gods from, and it's really from Tom Wolfe and Tom Wolfe's book. And it, it, the rabbit hole continues here, doesn't it, does it not? That um, um, the book from Bauhaus to our, uh, our house. And so why did, why did Eric say this? Well, you know, it, it was really based upon another commentator, Stefan um, Carstensen, who stated that in Tom uh, Wolfe's book, um, there, there's a sense of, uh, of, of compounding the aspects of the term white gods, and that there, there's a manifesto that becomes international law, that modernism, that is, becomes international law. And anyone that strays too far got tarred and feathered. <laughs> And so it continues. He, Eric also states, you know, after really beating the drum about hatred, he also says, I hate Rotis unless it looks best on gravestones and similar large architectural applications. And so thus it continues with this lovely gentleman, Lord Norman Foster who is an important part of the growth of the Jocelyn. Finished in 1994, Lord Foster designed with reverence the Scott edition, adjacent to the Jocelyn Memorial building. But did you know that Norman Foster and Otto Eicher were very good friends, incredibly strong and respected friends. It's really important to understand how this comes about. Eicher collaborated with Norman Foster on many occasions through the 1980s and 1990s. He designed the Foster and Partners letterhead and his Rotus typeface, Otto Eicher's typeface, was in and on many Foster buildings. He also utilized Rotus in many of his um, volumes of uh, architectural uh, publications. But in 1994, well, I should actually say in 1991, Otto Eicher passed away um, in an accident, and his book, The World as Designed, and please notice the, the title, the styling of the title. Um, Lord Foster included um, an introductory letter um, that was added in 1994. One of the great things that um, uh, Lord Foster did is actually help um, have uh, Otto Eicher's essays, and he, he, he actually wrote many, many essays, design essays, into English. And he states here, highlighted, we also felt that it was important to respect Otto's passionate objection to capital letters for starting sentences of marking traditionally important words. Perhaps it's, it underlines his scorn for the pompous. <laughs> Otto Eicher hated all caps, <laughs> as you may have seen through the titling. 
of the book. And that was an, in, that was an issue. Issue of, with hierarchy and pomp, the sense of being oppressed. But how can that be from the aspects of being a modernist? It's a very interesting sort of idea. And so, Critically, I wanted to sort of dig a little deeper, and I asked Amy Rommel here, the Director of Marketing and Public Relations, a few questions and, uh, about the use of ROTIS and how it became uh, a fact within the, um, the uh, atmosphere of the Jocelyn. And the font is shown in 1994 uh, with the new building opening. And by early 1995, you were utilizing ROTIS uh, nonstop. And the factor at the time is that the director, Director Beale, loved that typeface. And, it, and Amy does state he's not sure if he was familiar with or before that uh, Foster had in introduced him to it or not. But it's fascinating that it's, it can't be just a coincidence, can it? It's really, really important. And I'll get to the point of what I'm getting at um, very, sh very shortly. Another thing that Otto Eicher basically did state is that architecture is an integral part of the visual identity, not the other way around. Um, the idea that, uh, and he's not wrong, it is a visual aspect, it's a very iconic piece, and that's the thing that you see initially. But how can uh, a man who I look up to, who I have, I think, tons of his posters at home on my walls, um, have the idea that he wants to introduce his idea of what a taifa should be and place it upon um, an institution in this particular way, like a material. And I think that, that the idea that the community is not part of it in the conversation isn't correct. And so we have to sort of realign our, um, our ideas of what modernism is and what it does, even though I'm using modernism right now with this typeface. <laughs> so we come to the logo and, and the, the meaning. And what does it mean? And this, this, the head, as the logo is represented, doesn't really represent the Jocelyn. Um, it is an artifact from, um, from yesteryear, yes. It is lovely crafted, and it comes from the memorial building. But at this moment in time, it only deals with the past, not the past today and the future. And that is important, that the mark suffers from myopia, right? Only symbolizing that sense of past, not showing the significance towards the regeneration values that I had talked about earlier. So it needs to disappear. The Jocelyn Art Museum in the word mark, as what we call it, is really important. But the funny thing about it is that even with their relationship, this is no place for Rotis, the relationship between Otto Eicher and uh, Lord Foster. But Foster's architecture, as I had stated before, does something else. It tries to teach, and I, I sort of a quote, the, the value of deference and dignity and continuity and contextualism. But are we forgetting about community? It needs to disappear. And along comes Tsunoheta, the Norwegian US firm that's commissioned this 42,000 square foot addition to the museum. It is, in my eyes, the antithesis of what has come before. And that starts with this idea of the uh, tripartite, the idea that, uh, that consists of three parts. 
this sweeping architectural form. It is started through this idea of the tripartite. It informs that architectural structure. Right? And it draws on the surrounding natural terrain of Nebraska. And in Snohetta's words, the weightless effect of the hovering expansion recalls the striking cloud formations that blanket the Great Plains as well as the deep overhangs and horizontal expressions of the regional prairie style. And as Jack Becker has stated, that the Trapodite pays an utmost care and respect towards the existing buildings. And that's the fact. It actually does. And so did Lord Foster. And I believe that it's a key indicator of how buildings not only coalesce, but relay how regeneration works in their own physical form. And so how can typography align to this and more? How can we take the jostling, the Scott and the Hawks and consolidate with the idea of a unification of type, perhaps? How can that be? They're all from different periods. That's fantastic. Regeneration starts today. And with that, I started sketching to assimilate into a grand narrative to imbue with historical undertones of societal and cultural symbolism and an unparalleled artistic beauty that encompasses a progressive and forward-thinking discourse that includes the architecture. The approach that needs to lead to a deeper, more dynamic interconnectedness between the form and content. So let's start off with the Jocelyn Memorial, designed by John and Alan MacDonald, father and son, and looking at specific forms, angular forms, wonderful ang angles everywhere on this, including the type. It's phenomenal. And type also has angles, but these are sharp, stoic angles. Very sharp. Also very uncanny. The flaring is, it, it's, 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 it's not of this world. It's very bizarre. Um, <laughs> and so how do you sort of create, orchestrate these items together and produce the, a new anatomy, an anatomy that can take from the past, deal with the present, and be forward thinking? How can we develop type that works for the Jocelyn, that becomes unique and distinct for you. The Scott by Lord Foster is pretty rectilinear, very rectilinear, incredibly rectilinear. <laughs> But it's no joke. How can we be influenced by that? And the root of this is the young Serbian-American sculptor, engraver, Bershin. How can we look at the, the hawks by Snohetta that echoes the inside and the outside of the building, the curvature, also Grav gravitates to the rectilinear. It looks at that. It looks at what the, the Scot has done. It looks at what the Justin Memorial has done. And how can you apply these together and form an entirely new system? And so if we take the Jocelyn, the Scot, the Hawks, and we amalgamate it together, we fundamentally have the Jocelyn.
some may think it's weird looking, a mongrel. <laughs> a regenerative word mark has been born. Custom, sympathetic to the past, present, and future, to come to, to, to the cause of the museum and its community. And my wife, as I stated, is German, said it's not part of the zeitgeist. Yes, <laughs> but a lot more meaning. How can we look at the architecture of the type and how it reflects who you are? How it was born through a lot of frustration. <laughs> and this is just one wall of our, one of our, our rooms. How can we start to create a performative piece that is dignified, that is you, how can we create a system that is historical and contemporary and is um, our sisters coming together all as one? This is a, what we call a quasi-glyphic system. And glyphic means engraved constructs. This is part of the team that our designers, it's Bella, Ruben, and Pedro. Bella's drawing on one of her designs. But I wanted to show you very quickly, because of time, the, uh, the type system. Type faces um, are, how many people do, how many glyphs do you think a typeface actually has? It, it, it's actually between 20 and 40,000. <laughs> um, depending upon the languages that you use. It takes for a long time, but we've only dealt with the CAPS system, but that also takes a long time because you also have to kern the systems that you have. All the different elements, or no, not all of them, but just some of them. Unique numbers and character systems that we have generated for the museum to utilize, to utilize within these particular buildings. But more has come using the Jocelyn's current classifications of genre and categories. We also created um, a reverence through applying typography and chronologi um, chronology together. And so you have the examples of the categories on this particular slide here. We're utilizing our brand idea as an engine to, of change, um, uh, of agency, and, um, and then it applies itself to the historic and to the contemporary. And so what basically happens is that well, contextually you can apply new typefaces um, that are part of the system, um, part of the family, that we created a, a serif system and also a flare. So historically, you can utilize that. If you've noticed the all cap system, and this is an antithesis of Otto Eicher, because he used lowercase, um, is that um, we're generating um, a, a larger sweep of, of the family to, for its utilize, uh, for, for its usage. So initially, all the typefaces that you saw before, the three, are very contemporary to a certain degree with flashes of the past and also today. But in a sense, we needed to apply another set that uh, allows it to um, uh, work for the different pieces um, that you have in the museum um, at different decades. And so we have um, an example here from an historical, potentially 20 pieces, a lot of people um, initially basically state that something of that uh, nature would be serif orientated. And thus, uh, we apply that. Then, with the 18th century to the 20th, we generate the flair. To, to a certain degree, you can also use uh, the, uh, the more sans serif elements and styles for the contemporary. And so, again, these are built out of the regenerative construct. Um, a new way, a new fashioning of developing typeface.
But we don't stop there. I did talk about the sense of community, and it doesn't, it, it matters greatly. As you know um, from um, the conversation that I, well, what I was presenting previously in regards to um, indigenous people and uh, Prince Maximilian, that um, the Omaha Ponca uh, are exceedingly important to uh, Omaha and Nebraska. And with that, I want to um, run a little bit of a video. Um, if you can turn up the sound, if possible. Thank you. Omaha speaking. That's to tell them that there's a lot higher. of changes in my people, in our traditions. It's not the same. Today you look at it and get, you feel sad about it because those, don't, those people want, don't want to learn it, don't want to take time for it, they think it's antiquated. And they said, why should I learn? It's going to be gone anyway. It's because the attitude is going to be gone. That's what I said in the morning stage. They're not going to have to, they're going to wonder why. They're not hearing what I'm talking about. I often ask my mother where the language comes, and she looks up there. She says, he gave that to us. The language is everything for us as a tribe. Without it, it's really hard to understand the true identity of the Omaha people. Without the language, I feel like I would not have be a complete circle. I want to know my language so people know my tribe and where I'm from and to keep the language going so the traditions don't fade away. You know, I think Native American languages are, have just been a neglected topic in kind of public discourse for, for many, many years. As long as I can get around and as long as I can teach, I'm gonna teach as long as I can. If the little ones don't try to take interest and learn, we're gonna lose it. We're gonna lose it. So I'll, I'll stop there. <clears throat> And so <clears throat> through the Jocelyn and through consultation with the Jocelyn, um, we started uh, a discovery in regards to trying to understand the glyph system of uh, the Omaha Ponca um, language. And it's incredible. Um, um, within the glyph structure that we utilize today, uh, we use what we call Latin and extended Latin uh, for, uh, for English or, or uh, language is that Latin orientated, um, the, the, the keyboard um, is it's very easy. Um, with uh, Omaha Ponca, a glyph structure, it's a little bit more complicated. But um, through the help of um, a, a Swiss um, font uh, company called ABC Dynamo, um, we established a, a clearer understanding of how to uh, create this. And we do have a typeface that we utilize um, uh, from um, ABC Dynamo called Arizona, which is really what we call the workhorse. It's really for body copy usage. And they applied um, um, the Omaha Ponca uh, glyph system into it. So actually, we believe, apart from potentially uh, Times New Roman, the only typeface that actually has it, uh, um, as well as um, the Jocelyn systems as well. And so um, we endeavored to actually provide these uh, glyph systems um, within <coughs> the, um, uh, the type systems um, that uh, we presented here today, all five of them. And I think that's exceedingly important. And so we come back to this idea that the Jocelyn needs only a logo type. Typography is at the foundation of the identity. Typography aligns with the perpetual becoming and change of regenerations. Typography will be respected, dynamic, and illuminating at all times. And so now's the time for graphics. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to show you at certain moments the um, anatomy of the type um, to be celebrated. It does, doesn't have to be literal. It can just be the form that generates 
um, who you are and what you stand for at all times. The uniqueness of it um, is, I believe, and um, my apologies because I'm part of the generation of this, impressive. Um, <laughs> um, the, the idea of it working side by side and, and, um, is um, really, really distinct. The playfulness of it needs to be um, um, ever produced because that's what regeneration wants and needs. The eclecticism that it provides um, gives more the sense of voice and voice it will have at all times in every application on every bus stop and every poster and every reception and every catalogue and every scarf, please do the scarves, <laughs> and every bag and every sign. And as I stated before, it is a quasi-glyphic um, creation, its characteristics, and Rotis is also, it has also a glyphic set, but as Eric Spiekerman said, only works on gravestones and large architectural buildings. This does as well, um, and it's the right type of narrative. And so we come back to these wonderful Germans. Eric seeing that this is a typeface that is not a full typeface. He's probably questioning it if he was here today. And Otto perceiving it to be oppressive in all caps. So where do we stand? Well, remember Prince Maximilian. What would he say? What do you think seeing the Omaha Ponca language being celebrated through one of the premier um, museums in America today through a type system, which is fascinating, and is it building agency? And so I leave you with this. Regenerative narratives strategically will build better agency for this museum and its community, starting to share an ideology everyone can get around. Process. Regenerative cultures are not a static goal to achieve, rather they are about continuous transformation in responsive to change within the nested complexity that they participate themselves in. And I've also got to say, go Nebraska, go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, does anyone have, um, well, questions? So, so quiet. <laughs> and also complex, <laughs> I understand. Hi, thank you. Um, I wondered if you were influenced much or if, how much you thought about the Art Deco aspect of the, the memorial building. There's, it's so eclectic and, and that's a little bit of a blip in all of the modernism of the time. Um, did that influence you at all? Or do you find that there's like a little bit of a postmodern aspect to what you're doing or is that offensive? No, you're absolutely correct. Um, um, Art Deco is exceedingly strong. Um, and th 
through the anatomy of what Bershin is basically producing, you can see um, certain values that had come from the Art Deco. But, um, but then he also creates something absolutely unique, um, an artistic um, individual feat um, that he got away with at that time. Uh, and I was very impressed with that. And that also speaks to um, what uh, you have today, the very distinct constructs. But, so yes, the Art Deco elements are within it. But as I say, it's not about nostalgia or pastiche um, in principle. It's just um, certain elements there are, are there. There's certain modernist elements that are there, and there's also um, more contemporary elements that are there as well. Thank you. Come back into the light. <laughs> you mentioning Albertus as one of your favorites was my sign to ask the question, because I love that font too. Oh, hi, great. Thank you. Um, you, I think, did such a great job with explaining the sort of forensic work at the beginning and then the design process. What in the process or in the finished product was like your kind of personally favorite element or part? Right, yeah, I, I think that um, it was, it was seeing, it was talking with the, the team uh, and, and seeing the first um, birth of the first version. Um, you start to see this, um, um, this young system coming about. Um, you can see all the, the issues, but um, all the exciting pieces that have been applied. And um, what I really loved is that my designers listened to uh, um, throughout my, our conversations. They didn't just take um, my sketches and say, hey, do that, and I walk away. It was that we sat down and had conversation after conversation after conversation about it. And so it's really uh, you know, fundamental that um, the dialogue is, uh, that reaps the reward and also seeing um, the initial um, um, baby <laughs> that was being created um, and, and, and then refashioned, sent back, refashioned, sent back, refashioned, sent back, refashioned, sent back, refashioned. Sent back. <laughs> it, it, it takes, it, I don't know how many versions there are. There are a lot. And that's what really excites me because that allows one to create the sense of regenerate, the regenerative aspects that you say, okay, I think we're, we're here now, but I bet you by golly, we can actually readjust it later on. And by golly, we could, if you want it, we can actually make uh, lowercase structuring as well. So I, I have a question here as well, right here. Um, again, great work. Um, as, I, as I was looking at this, I, you know, I'm thinking about the dreaded AI, right? Yeah. And um, how just a lot of the process that you're describing could technically be put in an algorithm that could not necessarily come up with the incredible work that you've done here, but come up with something that somebody might might want to use. So I just want you to think about, or to maybe to speak to, right. if there's any concern about AI sort of taking over some of these aspects of what you do right now. Not necessarily concern, I guess some of it could be good creative components and others could be yeah. um, maybe otherwise. Has, has that crept into your uh, consciousness as a whole, as a whole not industry, not necessarily you, but the whole industry? Yeah, well, um, yes, I've been asked this question a few times, um, not so much on, t on type, uh, but just within the aspects of industry. Um, and I'm still trying to um, determine a clear enough uh, answer. I think I, I can't remember what I said previously. Um, but um, 
Does it concern me? It does concern me. Um, can it be utilized correctly? Um, yes, I, I, I think so, but what is correct? Um, that's, the, that's the deal. Uh, I think um, there are some worries from um, certain designers or younger designers or even old designers that this is going to take over um, uh, only if you allow it to. Um, that's clearly stated and um, uh, within this particular work, um, the, th the thing about type, type design is that it's craft. It's not, it's not actually an art form, it's, it's craft. And there are specific things that you must learn, but then also art comes into play, and design comes into play. And uh, in principle, I think that a uh, AI can potentially create a, a new typeface um, um, that is a derivative of something else. It's going to take a, some time to produce that um, within the certain aspects of the prompts. But I think I'm not going to have the same type of dialogue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, it, of the back and the forth and the back and the forth and the back and the forth. I, it's, it's a different type of dialogue entirely. And so there's, the, there's a human quality that, um, is, um, that you, one can actually grasp from the work that we've achieved that I don't know if, if that's going to happen with AI. But um, I'll keep my eyes open, definitely. Thank you for that. One last question. Last question for me, thanks. Um, I wanted to actually go back, maybe this is a good like bridge into it, but at the very beginning of the presentation, you mentioned the survey responses the, the conversations, the input from the community and from Omaha, and the handfuls of interviews and qual qualitative information that you gathered. Can you, if you were to slide in three more slides at that part of the presentation, can you tell us what those three slides would say, like a little bit more elaborative about that time, or what did you learn that like really stuck with you and the team throughout? Right. I know that there's the four points that like really right. rang true, but can you just Tell well, us more I, I about think, how I that think, went. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think from the aspects of demographic, it was um, we looked at it from demographics. Um, large, larger opponents of, of a white um, uh, population had uh, uh, also answered. Everybody answered. Latin, um, 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 Black, African American, uh, Indigenous, uh, Asian, but they were lower numbers. They were lower numbers based upon the population. That's one area. But they also, but it's not just the idea of the amount, it's what they said that's really important. Right? Um, and, and a lot of people need to remember that, that um, they want to be part of this community. That um, the um, Jocelyn of, of old may not have been as, uh, as, as from their perception is open, but now that, it, that is definitely changing. Um, and I think that's exceedingly important to, to note. Um, the survey also um, looks at it from the factor of uh, large pop. We looked at um, different, a massing of different zip codes within Omaha um, and also Nebraska, and, and then um, um, and then the peripheral states are, are around. But um, in regards to uh, what was, 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 uh, was stated is the name as well. Um, what is the name? Jo Jocelyn Art Museum. Um, everybody would state the Jocelyn. Um, a lot of uh, people stated that. And so um, you have to engage and connect with the community in regards to it, even though it's a colloquial term, um, to apply that. I mean, that's a very simple construct. Um, another aspect is that um, it's all about what a museum can do, that sense of insight, right? What can I learn? So education was key. There was a large amount of, of, uh, of um, information that was relayed about the importance of education. And not just from um, the aspects of um, younger generations, but also older as well, that 
um, the Jocelyn is and was doing a, a very good job, but it could even do an even better job um, within the educational area. And so that uh, aspect of being um, illuminating um, was an important factor as well. Um, I hope that answers some of the questions. That was great. No, thank there. you. Brilliant. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>